All right, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a good, nice lunch break. Our talk is about the modern architecture of search. And before I start, I just want to say I don't want to impose any, any methodology or technology on how to do things. This is just a layout of components, an architecture diagram of certain teams or certain components that are each dedicated to do a certain function. And our teams are cross-functional teams between researchers and engineers, and they're trying to find the best way to do this function. So I hope there's a key learning for someone to see how we do things. And we're changing the way we're doing things all the time, but the function of each component remains the same. All right, so a quick introduction on who we are. We're Zalando, who knows Zalando? Oh, pretty much everybody. I can cut the introduction then. Okay, just quickly, we're, we're not a small company, we're not a startup. We are, used to be an online fashion uh, retailer, but we're becoming now an online platform for fashion. So we're connecting brands, stylists, fashion bloggers, customers, offline stores, everybody who's related to fashion on one platform. That's what we're trying to build. And we already are connected with 1,500 brands. We serve 20 million customers in 15 European countries. So it's not a small company. Um, we'll be giving the talk myself. My name is Ale Hatba. I'm part of two teams, the query understanding and intention team, which we're going to dive deeply into, and also part of an architecture team who's designing how this would work and, on, and look the vision aligned with the product vision in the end. And my colleague? Uh, Mickey Brown. <laughs> I'm delivery lead for most of the search teams. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, as a first introduction, so, right, so we are, we are not just building like search, or if you think about it, search is really very, very central to any e-commerce offering, right? And, and also, so we are really, we don't think of ourselves as just a search engine or as part of a web um, website, but actually really as a platform for search across all of Zalando, right? And so here we try to uh, picture a bit like how we fit into this whole customer cycle and also article cycle. So in the, in the lower left, you have the customer, and this, this is supposed to be a monitor, this rectangle thing down here. Okay, and, and usually the sort of the journey starts with search. So they're looking for something for black t-shirts, and then this query ends up with a search engine which somehow produces the results, right? But where does the data come from? So actually, some like a few steps back, there's the factory which is producing all the articles and they get delivered to our warehouses. Uh, and, and then they're also, we're also taking our own photos, like we create our own content for the website. And some, somewhere during this process, all the article data gets input and gets fed into our system. So this is one important source of data. And then this ends up in search and can actually be, done, be made searchable. Right? And of course, so only after people found articles through search, they can actually order it. This goes back to the warehouse, and then the delivery guy shows up, and everybody's happy. Right? And at the same time, but, so this is like just the, the one, one part of the cycle. So article data goes to search. People can actually use it, uh, look for it, get the results, buy something. And then there are many, many different things like, so how, how actually how do we decide like what to show customers first, right? So Zalando, we have a few hundred thousand articles online at all times, and we need to have some kind of sorting to really show the most relevant stuff, and that's, of course, also something which belongs to search. Okay. Oh, no. Click just this. All right. So uh, before we started with the architecture, let's go to old school search and how we used to do it in the past. So in the past, we were just doing s normal string matching using the search engine right directly out of the box. And the idea was that to get the customer input and try to match it across many fields. And by doing that, we just run smart multi-match queries, and we try to adjust weights manually by the hand to find the better or the best combination that would reflect the customer, uh, what the customer expects to see from our result set. And doing things manually by hand was always very cumbersome, because when you fix one bug, you make other 10, and it was really hard to maintain. Adding to that, so we're trying to do a lot of scoring functions that we also maintain by hand, and then everything's become really fuzzy, and we cannot keep track of things. So that's why we needed a data-driven way to see how we can turn this into use machine learning, use NLP to improve our customer experience. And uh, that's why we wanted to move to a data-driven world. All right, so this is the layout of components I mentioned in the beginning. I'm going to explain how data comes in, how query flows as well, so how we can traverse this, this architecture or this layout of components together. And we're going to dig deep in parts, parts of it. So it's a lot of, a lot of different different things, and we cannot go deep. Each one of them needs a talk on its own, so we're going to try to get deep in the most important ones. 
All right, so let's talk about data ingestion first. Um, due to the nature of the data we're dealing with, uh, we have three different sources of data. Either we're using our product data or any data that's going to be searchable, or using the logs, which we're going to try to learn from and improve our models, or we're crawling data from the web, which are going to teach us about the fashion language. So the internet is, is rich with all kinds of text, and we want to learn from this text to improve the customer experience and how to search for fashion uh, using the fashion language. Then we have another layer for the data ingestion. We're, we're trying to transform the incoming data into uh, fit in our models or our data stores. Um, then our models are uh, the different components. So we have the fashion language, where we try to, I mentioned already, we try to learn from, from the web. Or phrases store, which we try to help the customer write better queries. Or the named entities, where we try to map fashion terms. For example, like blue is a color, uh, leather is a material, and so on. So we try to use uh, named entity recognitions through the store or the content, so the searchable content we're trying to do. And finally, data-driven sorting. So how are we going to sort these, uh, the result set is going to be shown to the customer. All right, now we go to the story of a query, how would a query would traverse the, the, the path in this architecture. And the customer journey would be he's writing uh, a query. So let's say he starts and writes tips in, in the search bar Adidas. And the first thing you will encounter is the query helper and refinement dialogue. And this component is responsible for establishing uh, a dialogue with the customer. So that's what we're aiming for, is to have a conversation with the data and not just a full text search or just we're trying to help him write the better query. And if he didn't write the better query, then ask him questions that what would be the next step to make your query better or to find what you're looking for. Auto completion is about, so we, we want to correct spell, we want to predict the next word, we want to resolve synonyms or acronyms, we want to disambiguate uh, terms, we want it to be even more personalized, so depending on the customer affinity to certain brands or certain categories, they would be ranked first as suggestions according to his uh, input that is coming in. And finally, we want to use this, this user feedback to learn how to do that. So how we degenerate these phrases that the customers are looking at, we have two different, uh, two different sources. Either we're using the, our original product data or we're using the logs. So for the product data, we combine different fields together, like brand, color, material, category, or product name. And we generate all possible phrases, but based on language rules that are predefined. We store this in the phrases store, and then retrieval is then using a scoring function which decides what will be shown to the customer first. We're going to talk about the retrieving score function later. Adding to that, so we want to learn this personalized. So based on, on the customer uh, logs, we can aggregate these together and know which brands and categories he prefers in order to decide this, how we would do this personalization. So the scoring function of doing these suggestions, we rely on hit position, which means the word that the user is writing. Is it the first position in the sentence or the second? So we definitely prefer to be it, uh, the first. And term frequencies. Also, entity preference. So if, if somebody's starting to write uh, a brand name or, or just throw in two or three letters, we prefer brands over colors, for example, because this is more relevant for us. And also, uh, brevity. Brevity means how long is the customer input in comparison to the suggestions that are generated. So you cannot enter just one or two words, and then you have a six, seven words uh, as a suggestion. So we're trying to keep it like uh, proportionate. And finally, user clicks. And user clicks have a certain time decay function, which decides OK, so clicks that came from last year are less valuable than the same clicks amount that came from yesterday. All right, so after the customer gets some suggestions, writes a better query, or maybe he doesn't use this correction at all and just writes something. And sometimes they don't use fashion terms that would be better for what they're looking for. So not all our customers know how to use fashion language. And would they say something like lange Kleid, which means like a long dress? And we, we try to learn from other customers who, who know the fashion language based on this fashion domain, and we use uh, something called the query query uh, similarity. So, when people are trying to refine their query, we know that and we know it's within the same category. We try to learn from it, and then when people would search for something similar, we would definitely suggest uh, based on the semantic space. So, we already know the semantic meaning of the user what is looking for, and we try to match this with something that would get better results for the customer. In this case, Maxi Clyde is the better term to describe these type of dresses. Um, and to add personalization, I already mentioned, so whatever the customer is doing, we're aggregating back in the search logs, and we improve our scoring based on that. So this was about uh, suggestions. And then let's go to full text search, how we understand user queries and how we construct them. All right. So let's say the, the user starts with, 
Armani lederjacken, which means Armani uh, leather jackets. And as you can see, there's a typo already. So the first thing, the flow of query understanding is the first thing we spell check. So we fix the user input. And then we check against redirects. And I'm going to talk about this later. But let's say for now there are no redirects. And then we do NER scoring. So we ask the named entity store, what are these terms? What do they mean? And for us, they mean every term goes to the named entity stores that are going to be checked for some score. So the term can be ambiguous, can mean different things. For example, leda, which is leather, can be a category, can be a material. And we score that in, in compar like according to the customer input. We get all possible scores and all possible entities. And then the interpretation engine decides, based on these scores for every term, to spawn all different interpretations combined. So from every, from every uh, map of, of term, to entity, we spawn all possible interpretations. So our money could be one time a brand, could be one time a product name, later can be a material, another time can be a fallback, can be a category. And also, we use compound words to split later Jacken. So we try to separate this. So it's in German one word. But then if we, if we want to search for later and Jacken alone, we have to split them. And all these interpretations are spanned out. And each one, it's a stream of interpretations that each one has its own path. And within this path, we want to enrich more information based on this enrichment, uh, based on this interpretation. So we would enrich stuff to try to capture what the customer, it's, it's, the customer input is missing, so we're trying to capture more, improve his recall. So some, some stuff like, for example, a leda jacke is also, Kunstleda is, is also maybe recommended for him, or Wolle jacken, and we do this as part of enrichment of this given stream. In the end, we collect all these streams in parallel. Everything is just happening in parallel. And we have a scoring engine which decides what are the, most, what are the best interpretations and what can be the customer actually looking for. And the problem is, if you have a five terms query, this could lead to 100,000 interpretations. And that's why, before we do any calculation, we try to use some rules to, to improve how we can make a good selection of, of interpretations. And in the end, uh, our scoring engine will give us some confidence factors on, on, each, on each query that is constructed in the end. So we, we have a structured query out of the unstructured incoming text from the customer. Until now, we bet high on one interpretation, and we use it. But we're now also evaluating to provide a result set that combines different interpretations together, and then gather feedback from that and see what the customer is actually, how, how we can learn from customer behavior what interpretation is better. So uh, back to the other example. Sometimes, sometimes there's always this angry customer, this gangster who comes to the store and just steps and blurs out one word to you, and you don't know what to do with it. So this guy comes to you and just say, denim. And, and well, what, what is denim? So are you looking for, for jackets or pants? Is it like a skinny fit? Is it tapered fit? What, what are you looking for? How do I do with that? How do I deal with it? And that's why th there is no data-driven way to, to deal with that. Denim is the most ambiguous term in, in the fashion language. And for that, we, we have redirects. So we try to capture. We, we don't want to piss up this guy. So we try to capture his, uh, his denim wishes by offering a redirect. And the redirect is a way of doing guided search. So we land him on a page where he can go through a denim, a different customer journey. So it's not search anymore, but at least he can still continue fulfilling his denim wishes. Yeah, I'm going to hand over to Mikio. Thank you. Right. Right, so this was the, the basic pipeline which we have. And the question is, so, but so far we haven't really talked about the data. Where does the data come from apart from the actual article data? Okay, so I'm going to start there and then also explore a bit more the more data-driven ways of enriching that data. Okay, so as I said in the beginning, like the, the most basic data you have is the article data, um, which can tell you like what are brands that we have, what are categories, what are colors, and that already can give you, get you very far. One problem is that this data is usually it's sort of um, collected by by people and it's not really it's not really optimized for the search use case, right? So there are some inconsistencies and so on. That's already a lot of work. But then there is also stuff like like new trends, like new vocabulary, fashion vocabulary that comes up, which is not in the article data, right? So like there was a trend like boyfriend jeans or hobo or 80s. So these are all some some concepts people use to talk about fashion, but which is not really in the article data. Would be very costly to add to to each item. And 
And then there is also stuff like occasions, like you want to you're looking for something for a wedding or for a party, right? And you cannot really go ahead and and like for each article decide which what text to put on there. So the question is, how can we actually enrich our data uh, using more data, you know, to to get good databases for um, for search? So there are two things. One on the left. Right, the idea is so you could, for example, crawl fashion blogs. Right, so there's a lot of text being generated about um, fashion topics. You could crawl all of that and then do natural language processing on that to to um, to both detect new trends, but also to understand like which, which words are actually related to the trend. Or you could also real sort of say, okay, there's a bit of stuff which we sort of know. And we can try to build an ontology for that, right? So not like ontology in, in this 19th kind of sense, but more so like a curated list of words and you sort of know what they mean and know how they relate to articles and also how they relate to one another. And then if somebody types in denim, right? So you could either have in the trends, you sort of know what it is, or in the ontology, you actually have a denim, denim, denim endpoint, which then tells you how to expand that thing to, to map it back down to something which you can actually search, right? So one, way, one thing, you can use this, so you have all these words, and one way sort of to, to, to automatically derive synonyms between words is an uh, algorithm called word to vec word to vec uh, a bit difficult to pronounce, okay? And so the basic idea of this is the following, that you use a, some kind of like simplified deep learning approach to, um, to learn a representation of the words in a vector space where similarities are semantic. So, Right, okay, so what does it mean? So the basic idea is, um, so you have like stuff like France with this capital Paris, so you have all these sentences talking about words, okay? And the idea is you sort of, you take the, uh, whether two words occur together as a hint for whether they have similar meaning, right? So here both words, France, Paris, both occur with capital, and that sort of says, okay, maybe this is, uh, if, if there's enough statistics to explain that, or to, to um, Right, then there is some relationship between these things. And what you essentially do is you construct, you, you sort of, you take, you encode all the words in this really long vector, which has just all zeros except for a one at the word which you're looking at. So everything is zero except for this one place where you have France. And then what you want to get out of this is you want to have the probability that this word occurs together with France uh, like uh, in the same sentence. Okay, and the, the model sort of internally, you have a much smaller space. Let's say maybe you have, I don't know, 50,000 words here, but actually internally you, you only have 1,000 numbers. You're trying to map this through, right? And then, so there's a very nice uh, post here by uh, McCormick ML, which, which explains this in steps, right? But the basic idea is you sort of, you're building a network which predicts these probabilities based on the input, but in a way that it has to reduce the dimensionality. And interestingly, what comes out is that in this space you have, so in this representation, in this space, words which have similar semantic meaning are also close, and you can even do like a bit of arithmetic in there to sort of take, uh, do stuff like, okay, what is like France to, Paris is like London to hmm, and then you do this kind of thing and you get out that this is actually uh, to England. Okay, and you can sort of, you can do this, right? You can take all the, the fashion blocks that you have and do this kind of analysis and then do something like a data-driven brand replacement or category replacement to sort of help extend um, the way the search works. Okay, so once we have all of this, so we have this big pipeline, right? We enriched our data from other data sources. And we, we first helped um, sort of extend the searches with auto suggest and other things. We understood the thing and have an interpretation. And then what you have in the end is, um, so you start with this unstructured query, which is essentially just the, f the search text. You do all this analysis and then you end up with a structured query and then you can fire this against like searchable contact tend to, which would be a uh, more classical search engine like Elasticsearch or Solar. And then out of that you get the result set. And then the question is, the next question is, so how do you actually present these results? Okay. And that brings us to data-driven sorting, right? So usually when you do search, uh, like full text search, uh, you have a lot of um, uh, indicators of what is relevant, so which word, which are the documents which contain this word very often and so on. But, but in this context here, because this is more or less a structured query, right? So this could be, uh, show me all articles which are in that category for that color for that brand, right? So there isn't a lot of, 
like the data itself doesn't tell you a lot what is actually relevant or not. So what you want to do is you want to take the um, um, like all the user interactions and all of that to sort of determine what is what is most relevant. Okay, and actually the problem is is pretty. So we, we often say like that that sorting is like the most political feature of search, because there are many many stakeholders who want to influence that, right? So let's say you get have this article grid, and of course the lower you go, the less relevant the articles should be, and then there are stakeholders, right, who say okay, actually I want to push up this article because this is from a brand we made an arrangement, we are pushing up stuff a bit, right? Or they say the season has changed, now we want to push up all the summer articles, we want to push down the other articles and all of that. And there are all these people who come by and say, you know, I want to change the sorting this way or another way. <clears throat> yes. And actually, so there are, there are different ways what you can do about this. So it's, it's not just simply, you know, you, you look at what people are clicking at uh, or what people are buying and you sort this up. But um, so usually you, you have some, so one thing we are, for example, doing, we are introducing a bucketing logic on the sorting, right? So we're saying there are different kinds of articles. So the articles which sell really well, which are where there are articles uh, where we had a lot of returns or something, and we put them into different buckets, and that already gives you like a very causeway to steer actually what's up and what's low. And then within these buckets, you can actually do, use a fully data-driven approach, which sort of, uh, again, the user, this is the monitor, and from, from that we get logs, which look like this. So there are different articles, and uh, the, the action, like people have clicked on it, people have bought it, and this is the position where it return, uh, occurred in the, in the thing. Right? And then what you want to do is you want to, of course, have the articles which are clicked and bought often higher up than the rest. And in the end, you can use uh, learning to rank. So uh, there were a lot of talks already on this, but essentially what you do is you get the, the, the article itself, so not the article itself, but some representation of that article, for example, in terms of uh, brands, colors, and all of that. Right? So you're trying to describe the article to the learning algorithm. And you, you put in like the, the rank where it was clicked, and then based on that, you're trying to learn a model which predicts well the, the rank of the, like what, in, which, in which order you want to present the articles. And you combine all this with the bucket logic to be able to, to steer the whole thing for your customers. Okay. <clears throat> and these learning to rank, so there are many different ways to do it. There's uh, one paper from um, Antonino Freno who actually works on recommendation. Uh, at Zalando, so I, I'm not. I'm definitely not going to explain this thing, right? But in the end, so what you have is this this phi w. That's sort of your model. It's a very simple model, which sort of takes your your features and just puts different weights on there. So it says, okay, this brand being if it's if it's this brand, then actually it should get a weight of 0.5 and so on. And then you sum up, sum up all these things, and this gives you an ordering. And the only interesting thing, sort of, is that the the loss function you're trying to minimize this piece down here. Right? That's actually what, what it's trying to measure is if, if this function you're predicting gives you the right order. Right? So the main difference between learning to rank and other kinds of learning is the, the, like how you're measuring the, the fit of your model. Right? And you don't measure it by whether you can correctly predict the rank or something, but if you take the predictions and then sort your uh, items according to this um, prediction, then the, the ordering should be the right thing. And this is sort of what makes these things a bit complicated. But this is a very interesting, nice paper, which is also very, very <coughs> uh, scales out very well, and you can really learn on millions of clicks uh, with very little uh, computational overhead. Okay. So this sort of completes the whole pipeline, right? So we had the, the, the layer, uh, the query, the actual query, we went to different stages, we got the result set, we sorted it. So the last question is, what about personalization? Um, yeah, so personalization, I mean, very roughly, the idea is sort of we're not, we all have different, uh, different, like, preferences and so on. And the goal is, of course, to find the most relevant article for each user. I mean, this is sort of, sort of clear, but preferably also in a way that you have the feeling you're not just interacting with the database, but actually something which is, which is trying to understand you. Okay, and the, the, now the interesting thing is if you take this kind of data-driven approach, then actually it's not that much, it doesn't, it's not that much more to, to add the personalization to all of that, right? Because um, let's say, so you, you already have a data-driven approach where you put in the, um, the features of your articles, but you could just enrich this representation also maybe with some of the features which you have on the user, and then in the interaction between these things, right, it's very easy or it's very easily general, generalizable so that you can also 
um, take into take into account like I don't know what your what the favorite brands of a user are or what what his past purchases were and so on, and you can just extend it. Yes. Okay. So this is actually oh. <laughs> on time. This is it. <laughs> so thank you very much. All, All right, right, we have, so we have some of time, time for oh, questions. Yeah. Plenty of time for questions. Good. There's one in the back. Yeah. Give me a minute. Hey, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was curious, how do you train your what to vec models? Which kind of knowledge base? Um, yeah, as I said, so the one basis is to, to have all these, uh, these crawled fashion blocks. Okay, but you have a, like a generic crawler or you just take like dedicated set of white listed sites and you just go through them? Yes. Yeah, no, we have a, no, it's sort of, the, the crawler also expands itself and sort of takes in links and, and, and discovers new blocks, but we have this kind of infrastructure running, which is, I don't know how many blocks it's crawling right now, but it's, it's a few thousand, I think. Thank right, you. But you can take that and then also extend it with uh, like, I don't know, Wikipedia dumps and all of that. Is it the same corpus you train your uh, entity recognizer? Uh, no. I think right now. I mean, the problem is you, you can, it's not so, the, you have these fashion blocks, but they're not really, they're pretty unstructured, right? And for this entity recognizer, you actually have to have like data which is, is, is labeled, for example. Thanks. Yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, it's a combination of both. We have, we, we mainly rely, of course, on, on the fashion content that we have. So we have a lot of fashion content from our product data that we can learn from. So this is the first generation of our model, but we also can, get similarities or we can get stuff that is related to it from, from crawling the web as well and see how people would relate to stuff. And, and these fashion blogs usually contain a lot of terms and a lot of things that explicitly describe how these fashion products would look like and it's another reference for us to learn from. Uh, you, you said you were training your models from queries. Can you talk a little bit about like how, what, what's the reoccurrence frequency of a query? Like how often do you see the same queries? What's the distribution of this? Can you maybe reform your question? I didn't get it clear. Like when, if 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 all your queries that you're seeing are distinct, learning is hard, right? So they need to reoccur to to infer some information from it. Yes, I mean there's of course a distribution of queries. So if if you look at it, there's a, like the top queries, and then there's a long tail of queries that uh, that are laid down. And some of the queries are like are coming very frequent. So on that distribution. I'm not sure how to answer your question, but maybe you can... Right, so, so there's a, probably it's a Cephian distribution, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you're seeing a, a lot of, like, a small amount of queries that are reoccurring a lot of times. Um, is this enough to train your models, or are you trying to categorize queries together to increase the frequencies? So, c can I talk about the query-query similarity, or <laughs> I don't know? If I can, should. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so we, in, in a way, we, we, we try to correlate queries together to find the similarities between them from the semantic meaning, yeah? So this, this already exists in the logs, and we know which queries are there. And if, if we put this in, in, in the vector space model, you already can correlate queries together. And we can also do it the other way around, that instead, uh, that we build a model that each product could point to a query as well. So this is way, way, there's lots of ways that we're trying experimenting with to see how we could model this. That's, that's one way of doing it as well. All right, more questions? <laughs> there's one. Hi. Hi. Um, you said you're serving 50, in 15 different countries you're, the, the company is uh, operating. How do you deal with 15 different or possibly more languages? Is it always the same system with different input or how do you do that? So there are 10 languages because some, some countries correlate on languages. And we have different pipelines, for example, for analyzing each language. We have different pipelines. We have different challenges in dealing with each language. For, for example, the German language has the compound words, which this concept doesn't exist in English. So that's why we try to deal with each language specifically on, on understanding, on enrichment, and on analysis. And uh, for search? 
like then when you do the query um, processing. So our our online shop is is distributed as each country gets its own domain, and each domain would talk its own direct language path. So they they do not they they're not together on one on one query search bar, for example. Thanks. Uh, first, thanks uh, for the talk. My question is about the learning to rank. Uh, if you have used the Solar official implementation of the Elasticsearch implementation or some custom solution built uh, in-house. Sorry, did you say which again? If, if you have used the, the official Elasti uh, Solar uh, learning to rank or the Elasticsearch plugin or something built in-house. Uh, Okay, so an official statement, we're big fans of Elasticsearch, first of all. And uh, second is we, we, did, we do not use and learning to rank uh, from, from any, we, we built our own engine and in recommendation and in search. And maybe Miki could say yeah, a few yeah. words about yes. it. Yes, I mean, uh, so Nino wrote the paper and of course he also did his own implementation of that. <laughs> okay, and uh, staying with the learning to rank, about the goal set uh, and about the number of features, if you can just give uh, some numbers to have an understanding of how you have uh, deal uh, with that. I think this is pretty detailed. <coughs> maybe, maybe, ah, too much. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe we can talk about it uh, like off, off stage. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you had a slide with an ontology on it. Um, my question is, what are you using ontologies for? First and the second one, which kind or which ontologies are you using? So we are using um, so we're using it also to to sort of record additional fashion dictionaries uh, or vocabulary like colors or something. But it's it's I mean so we're still building that up, but it's uh, it's nothing. It's again some so Zalando is one of the companies uh, which creates a lot of stuff, writes a lot of stuff in house. Right, so but the, the idea is sort of that you, you can find all kinds of words and then also know how they relate to each other and also how they relate to articles. Yeah. And the second question? The second question? <laughs> what, what was it? Uh, which ontologies? I oh, know, so these ontologies are, are hand curated by ourselves. Uh, on which level do they work? So are there top level ontologies, domain ontologies? You know that? No, I don't know. So we have a dedicated team that built this ontology, not, not, not even in Berlin, in, in Helsinki, which helps us support that. And one of the use cases, so we want to use these ontologies in, in different things, not just in search. So this would, would help the company in many different directions correlate terms and fashion, fashion terms together. And one of which is to, to try to enrich queries with, with better understanding. So if the customer writes something and we can, we can correlate it to other different terms that can make a better understanding of the user query. That's just one use case of how to use ontologies. Okay, thank you. So a lot of these topics are, are quite diverse and many teams are working on it. So definitely we cannot answer all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, just one last question about the learning to rank maybe. Um, <clears throat> you said uh, that from the uh, generated query out of, uh, after the query passing you're doing, uh, there's not much information to get back as a score from the search engine itself. If you want to do learning to rank afterwards, you need something like, you can do that on 300,000 results uh, that comes out of the search engine to calculate and re-score them. So how do you find something like the top uh, results that then are re-ranked to, oh. uh, to produce best result for the customer? Yes. Because you cannot do that on all the results. Yeah. No, no, so, we, I mean, so the, that's what I, what I meant with, so we are of course not re-ranking each individual item or article, but we're actually mapping the article to certain features, like the brand, stuff like that, you know? And then the uh, learning to rank works on these features, right? I mean, so what we're, so that you're not trying to learn whether this, this specific shoe, where, where this should be, but more like the, 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 uh, the features of that shoe, so how would that rank? Because. It's a very, very simple thing, right? You want to show people, some people are more interested in other brands, and then you want to push these up. But once you have these sort of things, you can, of course, put this, the, the scores also to the article data, and then, you know, uh, use, use normal queries to, to compute the, the scoring function based on that, for example. All right, uh, any more questions? 
This one in the back. This one in the far back, right? Yep. Yeah. And then we would have time for one more question, or we close it afterwards for offline discussion. Hey, um, my question was kind of uh, more specific to where where do you actually fit in the word to vec portion? Because uh, for your named entity recognition, you essentially do, I guess, query expansion. And that kind of made sense to me, but do you essentially take the output of word to vec and, and enrich your data offline? Do you also do query expansion with like France and Paris online with that? How do you actually like use the output of word to vec Should I get it? No. Okay, so yes, it is part, part of the enrichment process. We do different types of enrichments. One of them is to use the word to vec So for example, for to enrich categories or or to find any, anything that is similar. So to find similar brands as well for stuff that have low result sets. So if we get like a zero or three to 10 result set, we can, we can replace terms that to find, to increase recall, for example. And this is part of the enrichment as well. Okay, so that, then you do this online essentially for like replacing the query or terms in a query or categories that you filter on. Uh, it's not an offline process that you then add more properties to your documents that you search on? Yes, yeah, so it's sort of like a post-processing steps if sort of you have very small result sets, right? Okay. Because otherwise it would explode the, like, the expansion. Yeah, so the model is pre-learned and it's, we use it on real time, so yeah. on, on query time. Okay, so thanks, thanks a lot for your attention. So we, are, we have a booth right uh, around the corner and if you want to work for Zalando, come talk to us. Yeah, let's thank the speakers again. Thank you. Thank you.